another edition of the Backyard Professor podcast series. It's a beautiful early spring morning. The sun's out. I'm Jerry Schertz, the Backyard Professor. I recently had the interesting opportunity to see a professional historian describe how he views history. And I have been reading quite a few different types of books in history. And this particular methodology of historical inquiry really caught my eye, based on some of the information that I've been reading. One, on certain message boards, I have read that the historical Abraham has been shown to be a complete fiction because the written record about Abraham is a thousand years later than his actual existence, and therefore he's a myth. And, of course, this has to do with the Book of Abraham as well, the implications for the Book of Abraham. And just recently on another message board, I was, descri- I was reading where a professional Latter-day Saint historian, Bill Hamblin, was discussing the implications of the archaeological record in relationship to the Bible and to the Book of Mormon. And of course, the critic's stance is that there is absolutely nothing in favor of the Book of Mormon archaeologically, while there are empirical facts that can show us causes for the Bible. And Bill Hamblin has a most interesting way of analyzing this information on archaeology. And what I'd like to do is share with you some of his observations based on the written evidences and the lack of written evidences. Here's Bill Hamblin's idea. I do not believe that there are empirical facts about the past. I believe there is evidence. This evidence requires careful analysis and contextualization to create meaning and interpretation. This is the nature of historical knowledge. Anyone who claims there is empirical facts for the biblical record, while the Book of Mormon record lacks those facts, apparently does not understand the idea of how history functions, of how we understand history by normal definitions. We cannot interact empirically with the past because we cannot directly experience the past. We can't observe it. We can't experiment upon the past, so on and so forth. So if there are tens of thousands of empirical facts from the ancient Near East, we can't interact with those. Those are not empirical facts. What they are is interpretation. Without texts... See, the the critic Bill Hamblin was talking to, he says... To use one easy, blatant example, consider the empirical evidence for the Roman occupation of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and throw in the destruction of the holdouts at Masada. That evidence justifies the inference that those events actually occurred in the ancient empirical world in which the Israelites lived. Bill Hamblin says this is nonsense. Why would he say something so shocking, though? I've read about Masada. I've read about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And so, on first blush, you say, what is Hamblin getting at? Here's what he's getting at. He explains his idea. He says it's nonsense for this reason. Without texts, how do we know Jews inhabited Jerusalem? How do we know the Romans besieged Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, say, instead of the Parthians or the Egyptians? Indeed, how do we even know there was ever a temple in Jerusalem at all? We don't. How do we know the evidence of the destruction of Jerusalem was not caused by an earthquake? We know there were earthquakes in that area. I mean, the uh, Qumran community itself was devastated by one of those earthquakes. How do we even know the site was called Jerusalem? There is, in fact, no non-textual evidence 
that a temple existed in Jerusalem at the time the Romans destroyed it. Without texts, this example is neither empirical nor a fact. It is impossible to determine the ethnicity, the state, the religion, the ruler, the site name, the gods, or the producers of any artifact without written texts. I, I think that's a stunning uh, insight based on some other documents I've read. And then in another in another uh, part of the discussion with someone else, Bill Hamlin says, in ancient history there is no such thing as an empirical. As I've said several times before, I believe there's no way to establish ancient ethnicity or toponyms or personal names. You can't establish a royal dynasty, state names, gods, religion, belief, etc. without the texts. The pre-Hellenistic, now we're talking the time period of approximately 330 BC. This is pre-conquest by Alexander the Great. The pre-Hellenistic ancient Near East was literally hundreds of thousands of times more written texts than does pre-classic Mesoamerica. It is absurd to claim that interpreting the evidence in these two cases is in any way methodologically equivalent. The argument made by anti-Mormons here that because we have lots of evidence from the ancient Near East which allows us to discover tens of thousands of empirical facts, therefore we should be able to do precisely the same thing in Mesoamerica. This is pure fantasy. It reveals absolutely no understanding of the methodological realities and the limitations imposed by lack of data. Very interesting. They argue there are no written texts in Mesoamerica. We're talking about pre-classic Mesoamerica, including the first century of the classic. Writing in at least three different languages was known from pre-classic times. The Olmec, the Zapotec, and the Mayan. Writing appears first in the latest Olmec contexts at about 5 to 400 BC. This is according to the Oxford Encyclopedia of Mesoamerican uh, Cultures. Well, this would fit in well with the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon says, yes, there was writing then. However, unfortunately, because of the state of the data and the accumulation of the data that we have, pre-classical writing is fragmentary. We don't have an enormous quantity and we're still only partially being able to read it. The phonetics of proper names for ancient Mayan is generally unknown. City names are frequently written with emblem glyphs. Only in a few cases can a man, an emblem glyph, a sign, be read phonetically. Mayan words have been proposed as readings for some of these personal names. One example is Pakal, which means shield. Now this is the prominent rule of Palenque. Well, in most cases, Modern researches have simply assigned to the individual rulers nicknames. <laughs> and some of these nicknames actually come from English or Mayan. And these are suggested by the appearance of the glyphs. This is according to Scherer in the Ancient Maya, his fifth edition, page 141. The pronunciation of ancient Mayan is unknown. It's a thousand years older, of course, than the earliest phonetic transcriptions of Mayan by the Spanish, 